Praise the Lord. Folks, let me get myself slightly together here. I'm starting a timer. That way, when I look at it and I'm 40 minutes over, I'll go, oh, I, I missed it. Anyway, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm glad to be here with you and uh, glad to be able to share with you today. And, and uh, I'm, I got to share the same sentiments that, that, that you just spoke. I probably prayed for our country more in the last 12 hours than I have in a long time. I, Thursday's kind of a blur to me because of what we were doing in our office. By the way, am I on? Okay, yeah, yeah. And um, Friday, I flew all day and was with friends that night down in Missouri and picked up our vehicle. We leave parked in the middle of the country here. I live out in Seattle. And then I drove up here yesterday, didn't listen to any radio at all. Well, I take that back. I listened a little bit of the Hawkeye game. But anyway, that's another story. So I really didn't know what was going on until I got here last evening, as far as politically. And uh, it is time for the church to really pray for America. I heard, uh, some of you knew who Robert Jeffress is, First Baptist Dallas. And I heard him last night, and he says the, the best thing that Donald Trump can do is admit he was wrong and, and go on. And that would, of course, that's a repentance, is what he was referring to. So... Uh, that's exactly where it is. And isn't that what we, what we should all do when we figure we've done something wrong? When it's brought to our attention as Christians that we've, uh, we've sinned, that we have blown it, either by commission or omission, uh, the best thing to do right then is stop and get it right with God and then go on. Because, you know, we're, we're supposed to forget what lies behind and look forward to what lies ahead. That's what Paul tells the Philippians. And so... That's what we need to be, is those kind of people, and uh, of course the media won't do that. Uh, they're only going to look at one side right now. We know the media is predisposed to only look at, at one side in, uh, under the light that John, Donald Trump is getting, but um, God is still in control no matter what we see. Amen. I think uh, what I'm going to speak on this morning is maybe, um, maybe even more important than I dreamed it would be when I when we decided to do this topic, when Pastor and I elected on this some time back. So I I encourage you to take notes. I discourage you from trying to write it all down. Uh, I do have a DVD of this material, and I will tell you the DVD is about an hour and a half long, and I will not go that long this morning. Maybe. Anyway, no, I won't. And um, uh, so if you want to get this, as far as with lots of examples and all the the quotes and everything and I'm full screen on the, on the scriptures and quotes and pictures and so on, on the slides. <clears throat> then uh, we have it at the table and, and you'll be able to get it that way. But one way or another, I think the principles I'll give you here at the end are, uh, are very important for us because we're in a very precarious place in time. I think I'll get all of this out of the way first and kind of introduce the ministry to you and then I'll go back to, and we'll, we'll really get into the message. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. This week, we start our 34th week of full, 30, <laughs> week, boy, whew, 34th year of full-time apologetics and discernment ministry, and I've traveled 200 plus days every year of those years across the U.S. and Canada, and now literally around the world. And so we've been doing this a long time. As Pastor pointed out, I started out doing a one-night seminar on uh, the music business and how it affects the culture and how it affects the family. And uh, that's because I came out of the music business. I was a rock musician. I was a record producer, a recording engineer. I was a drug addict, an alcoholic. I was a New Ager before it was ever called New Age. And if God can save me, he can save anybody. My wife was into witchcraft. We met while I was playing in a bar while I was building the third recording studio that I finally ended up managing. And um, when I was playing six nights a week in a, in a bar, I was living with a girl, moved across town, moved in with my new living girlfriend. Three weeks later, we got married, had immediately had marriage troubles. And just by accident, I picked a full gospel, evangelical, Bible-believing marriage counselor out of the phone book, and my wife got saved. <laughs> yeah, and then for, for over two years, I put her through complete hell. And then I finally, kicking and screaming, I finally got saved. Thank the Lord. And uh, God began to call us into ministry fairly quickly. I mean, it was, uh, it was a very fast transition. And we uh, started talking about music and started talking about the things that we understood and that we knew from the music industry. When I met her, she, was, uh, she had a whole, whole line of witchcraft books in a bookshelf in her front room. Here I was, a practicing New Ager. She was a drug user. I was a drug addict. And uh, that's, that's kind of the story of our lives. And, and God has used 
us along the way and use us now with apologetics and defending the faith and eschatology. And by the way, the questions tonight, uh, don't let that, don't be limited to just what I speak about this morning because uh, my new book on spiritual warfare is coming out January 1st. Uh, I have uh, a lot of writings on the cults, on Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, the mind sciences, the New Age movement, all those kind of things. And so if you have questions about the occult, my, my largest book, which we have on the table out there, is on the world of the occult. So if you have any questions on those, those things, uh, don't think that we're just limited to what I'll speak about this morning or this evening, because we'll definitely go further than that. Um, I, I'm not sure why everything went all the way to one side on this. When, what, I wonder what happened to us here, because I'm seeing it on my screen. I'm going to try again. It, for whatever reason, it does not like the resolution we're set at this morning, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm not going to have to reconnect. Maybe I should just start over. Uh, my, my name's Eric Barger, and I'm... <laughs> there. I think we, we got it. Okay. EricBarger.com is where you'll find a lot of the information. In fact, that, that is really the, the hub of everything that we do. And uh, lots of information there. It's not just an advertisement for the ministry. It is way more than that. It has all of our newsletters. All of the radio shows that I've been a host on for the last seven years are at the website. You can download all those, listen to them. A lot of video clips. We are launching Take a Stand TV here in the next uh, couple of months. We've been working on it for the last year, really, to get ready to do this. So we're excited about that. That's going to happen. And, of course, we're on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and all over the place. And so you'll find us out there. Uh, please just sign up for our newsletter. It would be the best way to keep in touch with us. An email newsletter that we send out sometimes twice a week, sometimes twice a month. Depends on where I am in the world and how much time I've got to be able to devote to it and do a good job on it. We also do a print newsletter, and it's all free. And if you sign up for our newsletter, you get a printed copy of my testimony booklet that really is my wife's as well. But it's uh, how I came from rock to rock, how I came from that rock, the one that Pastor referred to, to the real rock, the one that is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Some of you hear me on Jan Markell's radio program. Uh, it's a great responsibility. It is time consuming. Uh, it's a labor of love. But uh, we, we put a lot of time in it. There are five full-time employees and two part-time employees just to put on a one-hour radio program every week to give you an idea of the kind of time and effort that it takes to do that. But I've been a co-host with her for some time. I started out being a guest with her 13 years ago and now been a co-host for the last five years. And so uh, it's a great responsibility. We're on 820 stations every weekend across America, plus the, uh, on the Internet. So we're, we're out there in all kinds of ways. Uh, just go to the table and look around. If you see some things you want, maybe it's, it's uh, less expensive to buy them in, in, some, in, the, in bulk, if you will. And we, we let you make the decisions. And so if you uh, are interested in any of those things, just go out and I'll... Oh, that's the one you all want anyway, right there. That's, that's everything that has my name on it on the table. There's a few other things out there that we think are worth their salt that we have from other people and ministries. But anything that's got my name on it is 239 at the table. We appreciate your support very much. And that'll be, of course, out there this evening as well. Now, isn't it apropos that this evening I'm going to talk about something that the media is not talking about at all? Something the media should have been talking about for the last year. Something, if the media was doing what the Founding Fathers gave them the responsibility to do. Do you know they're the only entity the Founding Fathers were counting on to do their job? And today, the media is not doing their job. Did you know that? They're the only non-governmental agency that the Founding Fathers counted on, gave them the responsibility to hold those in leadership in the government accountable. And they're not doing their job. And so the media is not talking about this at all. Some of you who actually were watching the news back about 1994 or 5 or 6 when Bill Clinton was president, remember that there were reports that Mrs. Clinton was having conversations with Eleanor Roosevelt. Do you know that's still going on today? And now she's talking to Mahatma Gandhi as well. But not only talking to them, She's now receiving answers from them and speaking as if she was them. Where's the media? Why is the media not talking about this? I'll just say it like it is. If you're a Bible-believing Christian and you read the scriptures and you take it literally, what I just told you about that is going on there is demon possession. Yes, sir. And there's no, no two ways to cut it, no nice way to say it. Why is the media not talking about this? 
Over a year ago, we started putting together the material for what is the DVD that I have out there. It's 68 minutes long. It doesn't just deal with that issue. It deals with how she got there through the liberal theology and the ideas that were given to her by J. Philip Wagaman, who was a Methodist clergyman who's now retired, and also through Michael Lerner. If you go online and find out who Michael Lerner and Tacoon Magazine is, you begin to understand the worldview that Mrs. Clinton had developed. Now, look, I, I'm not here in any way to defend Donald Trump nor to tell you how to vote, but I think everybody should have a right to know what we're going to get, what we're going to receive as Americans, and maybe it's exactly what we deserve when you consider the shape of our nation. God, help us. God, we don't want this, Lord, but it, it appears that's what's going to happen. So tonight, I'm going to ask the question, new age or not, what difference does it make? Remember that statement? What difference does it make? New age or not, what difference does it make? And we're going to look at the very dangerous spiritual ideas that Mrs. Clinton has, has adopted. Uh, she claims to be an old-fashioned Methodist. I'm going to talk about that and explain what that meant to her and then show you what happened and then show you what's still going on today and what we need to do as Americans. We need to be aware, but we need to pray for her. Listen, I'm praying for President Obama. I'm praying for the, anyone who's in leadership. I'm praying that God will have his way with that person, whoever that is. We are, we are accountable as Christians to 1 Timothy chapter 2 that says we're to pray for kings and all those who are in authority that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and reverence. If we'll pray, maybe God will do something. If we don't pray, well, I think we know what the answer is there. It'll just be more of the same. So we're never called to give up just to say, oh, well, it's prophetic. It's going to happen anyway. Too many people, I believe, who hear the talk about Bible prophecy and don't want to hear it will make the statement, well, why should I stand in the way of progress? It was going to happen anyway. We're never called to lay down and let evil run over us. We're to stand against it wherever we see it and whenever we see it. We're to expose it for what it is, but that doesn't mean we hate the people involved. And sometimes our flesh gets in the way of that. I know I'm talking to us. I'm talking to somebody in this room, more than one. I'm talking to myself sometimes when I say those things because I may not like some of the people that I see that are running for office on either ticket, on either side of, of the political spectrum. But I'm called to pray for them. It doesn't mean I'm not called to also expose this kind of thing when we see it. This is very serious. I'm going to show you tonight that what she is doing, God rebukes with the strongest condemnatory language used anywhere in the entire Bible. Yeah. This is, I mean, he rebukes this more, are you ready? Than human sacrifice. That's how strongly God has spoken out against the very practices that our prospective next president has been doing for over 20 years. We need to understand that. I believe that DVD I've made for some people will be a reminder in three years, four years, or in seven or eight years that we knew this was out there. And we then be able to track and look back and see what happened. So that's this evening. You can tape the debate with your DVR. Please come this evening to hear what they won't talk about on that debate or any other. So this morning, are you prepared? Do you know what's coming? Do you realize what is coming up ahead of us? I don't know when it's coming. I'm not sure of the day or the hour. No man, no man knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. But we can see by the signs of the times where we are in God's timetable. We know what's happening. Are you prepared for perilous times is the question. Are you prepared for what's ahead. We may have the greatest evangelistic opportunity in the history of the church just ahead of us. In right. fact, I'll rephrase that. We will have the greatest opportunity. But if we're not ready, we're going to be part of, of the problem instead of the solution. We'll be caught up in the mess. And so it takes us deciding now that we're going to get information and that we're going to have a change of mindset and that we're going to to buttress ourselves against what the culture of the world is doing. You know, if I watch only what MSNBC and CNN are spewing out, if I only watch that or even what Fox News is putting out, if I only read what I see in the newspapers or on some blog, I'll be in trouble. But if I understand from God's word that these things are coming and what I am to do, I can keep my focus then on what my responsibility is. And, 
I'm way ahead of myself preaching toward the end of the message already, but, and there it's, for whatever reason, done it again. We're going to find out why this is happening, but uh, I'm not going to stop unless it really does get in our way. The problem or the question for us is, will you be victors or victims preparing for perilous times? Will you be victors or victims in this day? That is the real question for you and I. Will we be the people that God has called us to be? Uh, as Pastor pointed out, we are on, whether people want to admit it or know it or not, we're on the verge of World War III right now. We really are. We're on the verge of it. We're on the verge of it. And, and that could be, uh, there, there could be maybe no election if that, if that happened. If there was an altercation between a serious one between Russia and the United States, who knows what would happen? Putin is, is, is asking the American people to intervene. Yeah. But uh, here we have, we have President Obama doing what he's doing. And so, you know, it's, this is a very scary time right now. It's a very scary time. But something has to happen to catapult the world toward the idea that only a world government can solve the problem. And of course, it doesn't solve the problem. It just makes it that much worse. But something has to happen. We don't know what. We don't know when. We just know that those are the days we're in. It's a scary time for young people. It's a scary time for 65-year-olds, too. It's a scary time right now. I understand that. And I know some of us, we, we've been schooled maybe because of the feel-good, happy-go-lucky church that is so prevalent all around us. And if you want a happy-go-lucky message, you can go and find it a lot of places. The problem is they won't ever tell you the whole message. I think it's a very positive thing to be a Christian. I can smile while I talk about the Antichrist, you know. <laughs> I can smile while I talk about the end times. Because I understand that God gave us the understanding of these things, not so we'd be scared, but so we would know. Our prophecy is a gift. Understanding the end times, understanding us, it's a gift God gave us. It wouldn't be in the Bible as it is in such a strong way over a third of the Bible. It wouldn't be there if he didn't want us to know. It wouldn't be there just to, to frighten us. It's not there for that purpose at all. It's there to help us understand. It may be there to light a fire. That once, we, once again, we become the evangelist God has called us all to be. Not just pastor, not just me, not just the missionary, not just the evangelist. Everybody, we're all called. That's right. To be evangelistic, to go out into the world, wherever the world is for you, to go out into the world and make a difference in the, in the culture. But today the church isn't focusing in those areas, at least not very much of the time. We see it all around us. We're warned about perilous times. Second Timothy chapter 3 is a famous passage. You've read it many times. It says this, know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And I believe we're in the last days, no doubt about it. And I believe times are becoming more and more perilous all the time. I don't think we've really seen anything yet to tell you the truth. But I believe perilous times are here, they're around us. It's not going to be for the faint-hearted. It'll be for those who understand the day they live in and know how to respond to the day they live in. And understand their responsibility before God. You know, the old... The old chorus goes, some glad morning when, this day's, when these days are over, you know. Well, perilous times are going to happen in the meantime. And we're not going to be immune to it. We want to do the best in our responsibility in it. Great rewards are ahead. By the way, you know, when Paul says this to, to his son in the faith, Timothy, he goes on and says, says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous boasters, proud blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent fears, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And doesn't that sound like the world that we're in today? But Paul's not talking about the world. And the next verse shows us he's not talking about the world in the end times. No, he's talking about the church in the end times. Talk about a perilous time because the world doesn't claim to have a form of godliness. The atheist world would never claim to have a form of godliness. Paul is talking about what the church will look like at the end of times in this passage, folks. Walter Martin says they have a form of the religion of Christ, but they're void of the power thereof. Exactly what Paul's talking about here. And Paul's answer isn't, see what you have in common with them. Go have dialogue. 
Now, that's, it sounds like we're very separatist when we say something like that. But the reason Paul says this to Timothy is he doesn't want Timothy to go and be infected by the very problem he's warning Timothy about. And if you hang out with people who are teaching heresy, and heresy has two different faces. One is when somebody tells you something bold face against the scripture, and one is when people leave out what the scripture says because they don't think it's really acceptable to the culture. They're both heretical, either one. Well, Paul didn't want Timothy to be infected by this. So we see this theological problem that we see all around through the church age. This is part of the perilous times, part of the day that we live in today. Then the, this predicted end times apostasy, you've got to say, is indeed in full swing. And I'm sure that, that Bible-believing Methodists 150 years ago, when that church began to fall apart, they probably thought it was too. And I, I was a Methodist as a child. I'm sure the Presbyterians in those days thought that this was the end time apostasy. Well, I was a Presbyterian as an adult. Now I'm just a Christian. Y'all supposed to laugh there, but anyway. <laughs> I didn't deliver it too well. So I've seen this from the inside in some ways. And then we go on and we see what Daniel says. And I could pick out so many passages here to get us started. And we're just now getting started here. But it says here in Daniel 12, in the most prophetic book in the Old Testament, Daniel 9, the most prophetic chapter in the Old Testament, and Daniel 12 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And that is, of course, Daniel speaking through a veil about the Lamb's book of life. What is our responsibility in the hour that we live in is the question for us. What are we to do? The next verse begins to tell us, and the third verse then solidifies it. And many of them that sleep in the dust, that's those who are dead, the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Heaven and hell being shown to us there. And they that be wise, my ears are open when I hear that in the Bible, I hope yours are. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they shall turn many to righteousness as, star, as the stars are forever and ever. In other words, we're going to be evangelistic. We're going to turn people to righteousness. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only righteous one. He is the only hope the world has. We can't be silent, especially at this time that we're in today. Now you say, but my friends don't want to hear about this. My neighbors don't want to talk about it. People have shut me out of their life because they know I'm a Christian and I've talked to them about it already and I don't like being rejected. By the way, neither do I. But just wait, because some of your friends who have rejected you already and some of your family members who have scorned you will be asking and looking and waiting and hoping for the answer that you can provide for them in the days ahead, if you are ready, if you are prepared. That's the point. Our lack of forethought concerning what appears to be ahead could cripple us from delivering the only message the world needs, the only hope at a time when they need it most. And they will be looking for answers. Antichrist is going to give it to them. When we're gone, Antichrist is going to give it to them. See, I, I believe we're going first, and if I'm wrong, you're all hoping I'm right anyway. <laughs> we are going to deal with a world turning darker and darker and darker. That's already happening, isn't it? I mean, what is next is my question. Sometimes I, I read the news or watch the news and I think, what is next? What, how, much, how much worse, Lord? How far will it go? What could possibly be holding your hand back? What is next? When you consider... And you look through the, the Old Testament, you begin to get the picture of the pattern that God has about how he judges. It's not fire from heaven very often. It's not floods very often. He judges with the hands of evil people. That's what's going to happen to us. I believe the restrictions on the Bible and the restrictions on the Christian message and the restriction to our free speech are perhaps the biggest deal right now for us to consider. 
Because if we can be the hope to the world with the hope of Jesus Christ, if the church can be the light to the world with the light of Jesus Christ, and yet it's now hard or maybe impossible, maybe, maybe illegal, I should say, not impossible, for us to give that hope, how terrible would that be? And these things might happen pretty close to simultaneously. Where the world falls apart, then we're told that we can't speak that message. What are we going to do? Who do we listen to, God or men? We have to make that decision. There's a containment on the Bible message going on already that's absolutely shocking. The more I read about this, I really had to go through a number of stories to figure out which ones we had time for to put in the DVD. And I've taken some of them out this morning because there's not time this morning. We don't have time to go through all of the different inferences that I know about. Look at this one. Just across our northern border. I was just up in Alberta two weeks ago. Just, just think about this. In Canada, in, in, in 2013, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled the Bible as hate speech. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled the Bible as hate speech. Wow. Here's the case. Supreme Court ruling upholds limits of free speech in case involving anti-gay proselytizer. That's why. Because the minute you speak out about a lifestyle that the Bible calls an abomination... It's now going to be called hate speech. Supreme Court of Canada, the United Nations and other places have already declared these kind of things. And this fellow tried to defend himself, defended himself as far as his money would go. Here is a street preacher talking about how that lifestyle is an abomination before the Lord. I mean, God didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah by accident. Right. And this fellow finally gave up and immigrated to the Philippines. Because it had already destroyed his life. He could no longer fight the battle with the country of Canada. And it was the Human Rights Commission that started it. Now, I want you to take great note here that whether it is a local, a state, or a federal Human Rights Commission, they are appointed bureaucrats, appointed by politicians, to do the bidding of the politician that appoints them. But they have the ability to use law when they make rulings. Think about that. And instead of being innocent till proven guilty, you are guilty by their words until you prove yourself innocent. They have found a way to turn our court system around. Notice how the human rights commissions around our nation are being reported on and what they're doing, and you will understand what is going to happen before us in our nation. How our Constitution is being turned upside down in this way. I believe the Constitution is a great document that God had his hand in in helping those men to craft it. I, I'm not saying it's inerrant. That's not the, the point. It's not like the Bible. But I believe God has his hand on it. It's obvious the way he's used America as a great evangelistic tool to touch the world for the last 200 years. But the human rights commissions are getting in the way of this. This particular fellow knew that. Bill Watcott, when he finally... Went to the Philippines. Look at this one, 2007. Pastor found guilty of hate crime. Hate crime. Why? A pastor in Alberta wrote a letter to the Red Deer Alberta newspaper. And in the letter, one sentence said that the gay lifestyle was an abomination before God. A teenager who is gay was beat up two weeks later by two men. And they used as a defense in court that the pastor's letter is what caused them to beat up the gay teen and the pastor was arrested and tried with the men that beat the kid up. And it was only on their say-so. It might have been their, their, their uh, lawyers that gave them the idea to do that. But it was the Alberta Human Rights Commission. Look at this one. World Net Daily reported, government to pastor... Five years into the court case, they said, if you renounce your Christian faith publicly, we'll let you off the hook. We never may have, us here in this room, a national case where something like this takes place in our lives, but we might be faced with the same kind of decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. How are we going to handle them? To renounce his Christian faith, he'd be let off the hook. This is the man, Stephen Boyson. He fought this for 10 years and spent $200,000 of his own money. 
He was asked what happened. He said, my life as I know it is over. In 2015 or 14, the um, Supreme Court of Canada found him not guilty and let him off after this whole mess and after all that money was spent. You say that's a victory. Yeah? Kind of. But this is what's happening at the hands of, of appointed bureaucrats, not elected bureaucrats. Look at this one from Scotland. Preacher arrested for talking publicly about sexual sin. Now, he was an American. Those Americans, they always cause trouble. <laughs> On the street, he was preaching against immorality, and he said that God can deliver you from any immorality in your life. A lady heard that and was, was upset and went and got the constable, and he was arrested. And it was called hate speech. Hate speech. Hate speech is the new way to destroy somebody's life. Hate speech. Preacher on trial for calling Islam demonic in a sermon. Out of a 50-minute sermon for 45 seconds, this fellow said that Islam was demonic. And he was arrested in Belfast, Northern Ireland, a church of 3,000 people. And he was put on trial. He resigned in the meantime as he was at the end of his ministry anyway, and he wasn't going to fight the battle and have the church be drugged into it as him being the pastor when he gets finally put in jail. But he was let off. Yeah, they, they let him off. They said that he was free to go. No restrictions. But they intimidated him to the place that other pastors are now afraid to talk about, especially if their sermons are live on the internet as his was, and that's how they got him, they said. Because they said he violated the United Nations Code of Correct Speech on the Internet. I do that almost every day. Pastor Bill, can I say that you do too? We all do. Anybody who's on, we do. I've experienced this personally. On Saturday, November 28th, 2015, this last year, our radio program aired. It, uh, it debuts at 9 o'clock every Saturday morning, Central Time. And uh, by, by mid-afternoon, we had gotten an email from YouTube telling us our YouTube channel had been suspended because we had violated the user agreement. Well, the, the program we had on that morning was about Christian persecution. And frankly, as I listened to the program, even though I was not involved in the actual program, I'm a co-host on the program, I wasn't involved that day. Jan Markell interviewed a fellow who'd written a book about persecution around the world. And they had talked some about Islam and how Islam is persecuting Christians. That's in the news all the time. That's something we all know. By mid-afternoon, we get this email. Jan gets an email saying that our YouTube channel has been suspended. And, and of course, there's nobody to call it YouTube. There's no phone number. It's the great Google head that owns YouTube. You know, yeah. Google owns YouTube. And, and who do you call? So we begin to call our friends and our, our uh, uh, compadres and the media and other Christian ministries and so on to find out if they'd ever experienced something like this. Because the five of us who are the voices on, on the radio program, three of us as co-host and one as an announcer and one as a, as a producer, we... We never experienced something like this. We didn't know that, that this was happening. We came to find out pretty quickly that many other Christian ministries had been censored in, in the Christian media. or I, I'm sorry, in the media. That is such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, etc. We, we found that out. But we were the first media ministry that we knew of that had happened. There was no other stories out there about it. So we decide we're going to do a program on this, make sure it's on the next week to talk about it. And we made some calls on that Sunday and on the Monday. And Joseph Farah at World Net Daily was one of the calls that Jan made, a personal friend of hers and somebody we've had in our conference at, up in Minnesota, which is next weekend, by the way, in Minneapolis this year. And Joseph put one of his reporters Bob Unruh on this story. So Bob Unruh calls Jan on, on Monday morning, the 30th, and asks for her comments and says there's going to be a front page story on World Net Daily. Now, World Net Daily has been rated as the second most read news source on the internet. So they have some clout. And so he wants her comments. She gave him comments. And he said, I have a number to call at YouTube. I don't know how he got it. But he had the secret number to call over at YouTube. So he calls over there and gets somebody on the phone and tells him what he's going to do. He got put on hold. A manager comes back on the phone. And as Bob begins to explain the story he's going to write about YouTube cutting us off, 
the manager says, oh, this is a horrible mistake. We, we don't know how this happened. We're going to turn their account right back on right now. It's all an accident. And you can believe that if you want to. So they turned us back on. He went right ahead and wrote the story, by the way. And we went right ahead and did the radio program on it. And you know what? A month later, they did the exact same thing again. And this time, we didn't have to go through all the rigmarole. We just called Bob. Said, Bob, you got that number? You want to use it again? And they turned our account back on. What we do is we take a little snippet from the radio program, and we put, put up a static picture and play that snippet in the audio on YouTube because we're trying to, in any way possible, use the internet or the media available to us to get the word out on what we do, on the topics that we think are important, the things we speak about. And so that's the story. And I've seen this up close and personal. And then we begin to find out about some of these other ministries. Charisma News here says, Facebook, Apple, Google censoring Christian speech. Look at this one. Facebook, Google, Apple censoring religious speech. And we begin to read these and begin to see this has been going on for quite some time. How the speech had been censored. And here's Eric Schmidt. He is the head of Google who owns YouTube. Biggest search engine in the world. This is in the Guardian newspaper in the UK. It says, Google's Eric Schmidt calls for a spell checker for hate and harassment. A hate speech spell checker. So if you search for something that they think is not politically correct by their standards, you can't find the pages. We saw it again. BBC News. Same story. We saw it again, the Daily Mail. You know what? You never saw it printed in a United States newspaper, not even the New York Times, as left as they are. It was only in Europe because that wasn't for our consumption. That was only for the world to know that this is what Google is going to do. Interesting, right? Go a little further, May 31st. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Microsoft sign EU hate speech code. They've already done it. I'll read it again. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Microsoft sign European Community Hate Speech Code, promising to censor anything that they believe is hate speech. Be a lot of scriptures they could call hate speech, by the way. Yeah. Just understand, because it's us that's being pointed at. They'll say it's the neo Nazis. I'd love to shut the neo Nazis up. I'd love to shut them off. I'd love to shut those who were hate mongers off. You know, something Michelle Bachman said to me one time, every time I think about how badly I'd like to stop people from saying things that I disagree with, I remember what she said to me privately once, that the First Amendment of our Constitution isn't about protecting the speech we all agree with. It's about protecting speech that very few agree with. And our First Amendment is the biggest, the biggest, uh, how should I put this, insect in the works for these people. It is the biggest thing gumming up their process. Because our First Amendment gives us the right to say things that is not politically correct. Because political correctness was never in the minds of those in our government or who were forming our government back in 1774, 5, and 6. But... In our world today, politically correct. You've got to be politically correct or it's over. And then that leads to the next thing, October 1st, a few days ago, where President Obama, and we know this was coming, a few Republicans tried to stop it. A couple of Democrats tried to stop it. Nobody listened. He gave over the control of the naming and literally the control over the addresses on the Internet, the URLs. URL is the WWW address. He gave control of that to the United Nations. They could tell me because I do hate speech that my website is no longer valid and anybody that tries to find me can't find me and doesn't know what happened. It's only begin. It's, it's only in the beginning stages. So it's not happened yet. You haven't noticed anything different on the internet probably yourself. Just give it time. Why would we give up the control of being able to index and authorize the use of a particular web address or any web address? Why would we do that? 
It's only because what's coming down the road and what's next. And right now, the internet is the way we can communicate on these issues. It is besides telephone, but it's the only way you can publicly communicate because the left-wing newspapers are so left-wing, they don't print any of this stuff. It is the blogs. It is the newsletters, it is the websites on the internet where communication is done on issues that are opposition to the new world order. You see where this is going? I know some of you, this is like sweat material. I get it. I get it. But it's best to know about it than just turn a blind eye and say, oh, I don't care as long as the Cubs win the World Series. Oh, I don't care as long as my favorite is on America's Got Talent. I don't care as long as whoever your football team is, whatever you, whoever you root for, because you're between so many of them right here. As long as they get in the playoffs, we, we, we lose sight of these things so quickly. Like I said a minute ago, free speech is not about protecting the speech of the majority. We have to understand that and recognize we have a First Amendment to give us all the right to speak things that may not be accepted to others. I'm not endorsing hate speech. What is truly hate speech that is really victimizing to somebody? But when the, when the Bible is called hate speech, we are in real trouble. Amen. And the Canadian Supreme Court has already done it. And they're trying to figure out a way to do it here is the point. Man, I have 19 minutes left. How am I going to do this, Lord? Help me. Two main battlefronts we're going to be on for a long time. One will be the LGBT and whatever other letters they keep adding on at the end of that. That will be one, transgender bathrooms, etc. And the other one is Islam. Because Islam has an edict that anyone who speaks out against Allah or his prophet should be shut up, should be stopped. And so Islam is trying to use this and has done so very successfully to try to use this as a, a tool. In fact, Mrs. Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, after publicly opposing the blasphemy law for two years, Mrs. Clinton, as their spokesman for this, and the Obama administration did a 180 degree turnaround in 2011. Aided by Mrs. Clinton, the UN, here it is, Human Rights Commission, which includes those human rights giants like Canada, uh, China, Cuba, Libya, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, by the way, introduced a bill. They had tried to pass a blasphemy law for 10 years and it never got enough votes. But there's a large consortium at the UN of Islamic groups from different Islamic states, 57 of them. Not like Heinz, by the way, but 57 of them that tried to pass this blasphemy law. And in 2011, with Mrs. Clinton writing the bill, they passed Resolution 1618. Write it down. Resolution 1618. Go and search and see what that says. You'll find me in the first page of, of the results because nobody's talking about this. If everybody's talking about it, I'd be pushed way down, the, and I'd be glad because more people would be talking about it. I'd be pushed down the search ratings. Resolution 1618 at the UN was passed in March of that year. Now, they reported on it, but it didn't make the nightly news, and that's where most people get their news. Reuters talked about it. West Free Speech Stand Bars Blasphemy Ban, OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conference. So Revolution, Resolution 1618 passed the UN. And there were, like I said, news stories all over the place. Criminalizing intolerance. The Obama administration moves forward to United, on United Nations resolution targeting anti-religious speech. On and on. So with many news stories about it, I'm not going to go through all of them. What happened in December, though, December, six months or seven months after that was passed, Mrs. Clinton invited the head of the UN and these 57 organizations from 57 Muslim countries to come to the White House to have a confab, a conference for three days to discuss how they could circumvent the United States Constitution and our First Amendment and employ Resolution 1618 in our country. Many countries in the world have it in their own constitution as a country that if the UN passes a law, it becomes law in their country immediately. We do not. Our Senate has to pass anything that the UN uh, states. Yeah, exactly. But if they can get around our constitution, they want to because they want to criminalize any criticism of Islam. That is the goal. 
That's their stated goal. That's why you, uh, Resolution 1618 actually exists. That is their goal. They went from defamation of religion to incitement of violence through hate speech. I'm going to do a TV segment on this, by the way, so you'll hear about it when I uh, put our email newsletter and it's in there and you'll be able to get this sometime between now and first of the year. The systematic marginalization of Christianity is underway. It's been underway for quite some time, but now it's becoming very bold and very upfront. We were once the respected not long ago, and now we are the suspected. Because the minute you say you're a Christian, people are now looking at you as if you're a hate monger and a bigot and all of those things. And those are the only, those words count so much in the culture today. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. People start saying it. It becomes a, a mantra to people. People just start repeating what they've heard. All this is going on while the U.S. Army, in their reserve training, is presenting seminars like this. Extremism and terrorism, to, I'm sorry, extremist organizations. This was given in Pennsylvania and Virginia, and someone in one of those training sessions actually sent me this. This is a list of religious extremists. First on the list is evangelical Christianity. Notice Al-Qaeda is one, two, three, four, sixth on the list. We are now not just suspected. That's right from the slides shown to U.S. Army Reserve trainees. We did radio on this, by the way. There's an article on my, on my website about it. Point is, the gospel message and our ability to present the gospel itself is a target of the PC police. We read about persecution in the Bible. You know, until I went to Israel, I would read the stories in the scripture and I would think they're so far back in time and they're so far separated in space. When I got to Israel, I saw they're so far back in time and they're all together in space. As we stood on an overlook, looking over the Valley of Armageddon. It's where the Israeli Air Force has their, their takeoff and landing spots for their jets that circle 24-7 around their country. We could see several prophetic spots where events took place that we've read about in the Bible that we know by heart. It's amazing. When we think that persecution is only for some faraway place and it was only at some other point in time, I've got news for you. Those men in the orange jumpsuits getting their heads cut off on the beach in Syria, in Libya, they were having their own tribulation right there on the spot. And they were experiencing that. Now, I don't know if we're going to see that here before Antichrist. All I know is this. We need to know what we're going to do next. And if we don't formulate a plan, we're in trouble. That's the point of the message this morning. I could give you so many more facts, and we don't have time. I could go through so many more steps here. Most Americans have not gone through a Holocaust, thank God. We've not been forced to live out our faith like people in North Korea or Iran are having to live out right now, living in secret, living, living, hoping that they don't find out about the small church meeting they're having in their basement or their attic at 2 or 3 in the morning. What will we do to prepare for perilous times? Pastor already said it. He had no idea. It's just common sense if you're a Christian, and that is live without compromise. He stood here and told you what you should be doing. He began. Two of my points right here were already came out of his mouth. He stole my thunder. God bless him. <laughs> live without compromise, number one. Repent. When he talked about secret sin, he hit the nail on the head. That's, I say it. I say it when I get to this spot in the message. Repent. If you have things in your life that you know are right before God, this is not the time to hang on to them and figure it out later. This is the time to figure it out right now. This is a time, and you know what to do. Examine your priorities. I've already said this to you. What are your priorities? See, if we don't think about these things a little bit now, trouble is really coming and coming quick. George Gallup was addressing some church leaders. He said, the lifestyle of Christians in America is little different than the rest of American culture. That's not a shock to you. But he went on to say something else, and I, 
I came upon this because Erwin Lutzer, who had been a speaker at our conference and somebody we'd interviewed on radio, he's a, a pastor at Moody Church in Chicago for many years, he's now retired, he wrote a book about this called Pastor to Pastor about these kind of issues. And he said, I want you to look at this page in my book. I asked him sitting in our conference center, or the, the church that we use for, for our conference up in Minnesota about three years ago. Only two in 10 Christians in America said they'd be willing to suffer for their faith. That question was asked of Christians in America in an air-conditioned room in the summer or a heated room in the winter with nobody holding a gun to their head, with nobody forcing them to give an answer. That means the answer is probably one in a hundred when the chips are down. That's trouble. Because the feel-good, happy-go-lucky Joel Osteen church has destroyed the backbone of American Christianity. That's trouble. People say, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with those messages. Look what it's done to us. Little by little, how soft we have become as Christians. We need to exercise discernment in this day we live in. I mean, that's our whole ministry is talking about discernment and apologetics. We need to be discerning. We need to choose carefully where we get our news sources from. Our news from, what sources? We need to choose carefully. If you're listening to news that tells you Islam's a peaceful religion, you're listening to the wrong channel. If you're listening to news that tells you global warming is a fact, you, you better change quickly. If you're listening to, to news that tells you that Israel, the oppressors, forget it. Or that the economy's fixed or anything else like that. Be aware of prophetic events taking place. Yes. Again, these aren't the negatives. I mean, it's going to happen during somebody's watch. It looks like it's going to happen during our watch. And if it is, aren't we supposed to be the people telling the world what's coming? That's right. Instead, we're, our mouths are shut. Except the remnant. Yeah, the remnant like those people in Bill Randall's church up there in Iowa. Those guys. Uh, yeah, the remnant... So you're the remnant. People in this room right here, you've been hearing and knowing and understanding. You've been hearing this man and others tell you and talk to you about this. And because you understand what the scripture says, many of you here, you've been hearing this for a long time. You're the remnant. The remnant shrinks and shrinks and shrinks in the end times, folks. People talk about great revival coming. That's not what the Bible says. No, we want to save everybody we can or get them saved because we can't save anybody. We want to do anything possible to see them saved. The problem is the remnant gets smaller and smaller. By the way, we also get more vocal and we get louder and we get more noticeable in the culture as we go along. We don't just get underground and try to just preach to the choir all the time. So be aware of the prophetic events. If I'm not careful, I'm not going to make it here. So I got to keep going. You've heard John Haller not long ago, John's close friend. And I would encourage you to get John's prophetic update. He does it every week. It is amazing how he puts it together. John is not a preacher, not, he would say, not a pastor, he would say. I met John when his denomination was basically putting him out the door because of his stands against contemplative prayer in the, the emergent church. And we became friends through me sharing research and trying to hold his hand up and pray for him and encourage him along the way. And John has now got a prophetic voice. I mean, strong prophetic voice. Think 30,000 views a day some days. I mean, it's amazing what is going on in their ministry. You need to get John Howler's prophecy update and see it. Others. News headlines from my radio partner, Jan Markell. It's a labor of love. Six days a week, she puts news headlines out in a free email. All they are are links to stories that she believes are important for prophetic thinkers. Yeah. You can subscribe at olivetreeviews.org. My friend Bill Koenig, he'll be one of our speakers next weekend, next Saturday, at uh, Understanding the Times up in Eden Prairie. And Bill is a White House correspondent. He's been in the White House press corps since the middle years of Clinton. How he's kept his papers the last seven and a half years, I have no idea. Bill's new book is called Revealed, Obama's Legacy, and he goes from day one to the present on what has happened and what legacy Obama has left behind, and it's not good. Tom Hughes, 412 Church, San Jacinto, California. 
endtimestv.org. Tom is in season. Excellent communicator on end times. Does a weekly blog that comes out every Wednesday, a video blog. J.D. Farag's been doing this longer than all the rest of us. Over 10 years now. He's in Hawaii, a Calvary Chapel pastor. Great information. And Jack Hibbs, Southern California, another Calvary Chapel pastor is speaking up on these things. I'll, uh, if you need more, if you need those again, any of those names, come and talk to me. We need to major on the majors, folks. That doesn't mean that we forget anything that we know is in, inconsistent with Scripture that somebody else believes in. But too often we get so focused on that that we, we want to we throw a brother or sister, you know, off the bridge. Let's major on the majors. We're going to need each other at this point in time. And I'll admit some of those peripheral doctrines, as they're sometimes called, uh, they're pretty central to some of us, and maybe for good reason. But let's be careful to major on the majors. Let's be cautious of following conspiracies. I believe conspiracies exist. That's not the issue. But let's be ca- careful not to focus on them so much that that's all we think about. It can't be our main focus. Our main focus has got to be on what does God want me to do now, not is is the latest Nephilim UFO controversy. Understand the growing anti-Christian bigotry that we're now experiencing that's going to get deeper and harder to deal with all the time. It won't go away by us trying to ignore it. You know, we try to ignore it. We're just as bad as the Christian science practitioner who doesn't believe that evil exists who for the first three days walked around hell going, it's not hot, I'm not here, it's not hot, I'm not here. Sorry. Reminds me of a story. No, I'll go right on. Apostasy is now becoming normal in the church. You've noticed that, haven't you? That's why some of you are here. Because you fled other churches where you saw it happen. You saw churches be taken over with emergent doctrine. You saw churches being, being swept under with liberalism. So apostasy is now becoming normal in the church. We, we're going to be called a cult. Just understand that. It's already happening. We, if you believe the Bible is true and accurate and you believe in Jesus' first coming and his second coming and everything in between, if you say you believe the scripture, you'll be called a cultist. You know who's going to do that first? The church. Pastor knew right away. Did you catch that? It won't be the media, it'll be the other church, the other churches. I'm not just pointing at that one. Don't get me started. We're in the days of strong delusion. The days we're warned about in Scripture. The days if we read the Scripture and understand the times we live in, like the men of Issachar who knew the times and knew what Israel should do, then we would know this already. We're in the day of the strong delusion. Life as we know it could change radically, change very, very quickly. Perilous times, and this may be the most important slide. Perilous times, you're going to need preparation mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Don't wait for it to come. Understand what to do when it comes. Mental, emotional, and spiritual preparation, I think is a very, very important spot in the seminar. You see, being that you here get your weather from the west, if you see skies like this, do you put on your flip-flops and sunscreen and and sunglasses and announce to the family, let's go to the beach? Of course not. But that's the way Christians are operating in this day. We want to ignore what is coming and claim everything is okay. And all the positive confession in the world ain't going to get you there. I don't want to tell any of you here what to do when you see a storm cloud like this. You, you think about your surroundings and where you are and maybe where the nearest tornado shelter is. Now, how should we prepare for this coming chaos? I can't answer all that. And if I begin to list it, I'll miss something, and, and I'm not an expert in that area. I read others. I, we had one on air that was very, very good that dealt with this. But how do you deal with this? How, what do you do? How do you prepare? Well, even Thema says have three days of food and water. 
But if you prepare at all, it can't be just for self-preservation. Listen carefully. Our natural fallen nature says, I must preserve this. But the, that's not what the Bible says. We, we think we just have, have to preserve our physical bodies, our, 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 our surroundings, our stuff. We need to preserve this so that this can tell somebody about that. I never said it like that before. We need to preserve this so that we can tell somebody about him. If we began to self-preserve just to keep ourselves alive, I think we've missed the mark. I really do. There's no question perilous times are here. I mean, there's listings of scriptures you can look at in the New Testament that will tell you. Daniel 12 talks about this, as you've seen. Let alone, we see in the scripture how these things are, we're we're getting the inklings of the signs of the times, the wars and rumors of wars and so on. And that's written to the Jews by, by Matthew. Jesus speaking to them. Well, he's also helping us understand these days. Prepare for the worst so you can be part of the solution instead of the part of the problem. When somebody says to me, oh, Brother Barger, I'll just trust the Lord in those days. Mm -hmm. You'll be the guy who calls the pastor at 3 a.m. coming unglued because you didn't prepare. And you'll be part of the problem. Let's not be that person. There are lots of great places on the internet you can look to figure it out. I have a safe room up there. People in Israel know. I mean, there's a cottage industry in Israel building safe rooms and houses. And again, it's just not for self-preservation. That's not necessarily what we ought to be thinking about, though. It'd be nice to preserve my body so I can go out and actually do the work of God while I still got breath in the body. Using common sense and a dose of the Holy Spirit would be real good too, amen? That's right. And I think we ought to be thinking that way. And we also ought to have a security plan in our homes. My wife and I have one. We have a two-story house where we also have our offices over half of, well, about two-thirds of our house is office or studio space. But we know what to do. She knows what to do if I'm not there, and we know what to do if I am there, and something happens, if we have a home invasion, etc. You ought to figure it out. You ought to think about it, talk about it. Every church should have a security plan as well because of the day we live in. It's just there's common sense involved with thinking these things through and getting ahead of the curve on it. And I'm going as quick as I can here because Islamic Jihad is not something anybody else in any generation in our modern times had to think about. But we do. But we do. We are forced to. Now, if you're uncomfortable with any of these scenarios I presented, imagine what life will be like and the sheer panic you'll be in if you hadn't thought about them ahead. And I can see it with a smile on my face because I know in whom I believed Amen. and I can trust in him into that day. Amen. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He is in ultimate control. He is the one that has the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the one that has all the silver and all the gold. He is able to take care of his children. If you're submitted to him, he is the one you look to. And it isn't based on a fuzzy feeling. It's based on the absolute truth of his word. He'll be with you, and Jesus promised never to leave you till the end. He never forsake you. We have great hope. We have great hope, and we have great responsibility in the process. We've been given the greatest message that anybody could ever imagine. And in the process of it, we can't allow anything to steal our joy. That's right. The joy of the Lord is our strength. That tells me if I don't have his joy, I will not have his strength. So our focus and our hope is based on him, not on everything that we can do here, because we should do everything we can do. And Paul makes that clear in Ephesians 6, you know. Do everything to stand, and then stand firm on, and he literally lists the Christian life. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet with gospel, evangelism, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. He's talking about the Christian life. Don't let anything steal your joy. I'm out of time. There is more of an ending than this. The ending states this. There was an ark in Noah's day, and the ark door closed, and the people that weren't in it perished. 
there's an ark in our day. His name is Jesus, and the ark door is still open. And if you're not in the ark already, you need to get there as soon as you can. If you're not living right and there's any doubt about whether you're going to be allowed in the ark, you need to repent and get there as soon as you can. And that is the bottom line. To be introspective, to look in and see, what am I doing? What am I thinking? Are my pers perspectives right? Are my, my thoughts right about this day, about this hour? What is my responsibility? Because someday we'll stand before God and give an account of what we did and how we did with the responsibilities he gave us. Let's be sure we give the right answers then. That we're able to say in all confidence we did the right thing. We were mouthpiece for the gospel. We weren't secret service Christians. Just interested in our own grandizement. But we did this because the kingdom of God is at stake. Father, I praise you and thank you, Lord. I pray and I ask, oh God, that each of us would get exactly what parts are part of this presentation, Lord, that you've intended. And Father, I pray that you will convict us and, and Lord, you'll, you'll continue to help shape my thoughts about these things, let alone those who have heard this this morning. And for those who have never thought about these things and never, never seen or heard any of this kind of teaching, I pray, Father, for them. I know this is a shock to the, to the human nature, a shock to our, to our senses, but Lord, help us be shocked into action, in, into repentance. Help us be shocked into following truth. Help us be shocked into searching the scriptures. And I pray, Father, we'll all search the scriptures, just like the Bereans. If there's any doubt about what's been said this morning, help us search the, the passages to see whether I've said, whatever I've said is right or not. Be with us, Lord. Be with us. Father, we look to you because you're the author of joy. Any joy we have in this world that's not of you, Lord, is a counterfeit, is waning. It is something that will fade away. Father, help us concentrate on you. Let us have the perspective of joy from your side to understand, Lord, that joy is what will draw so many if we'll let that joy show. Help us not be concentrated just on all of our activities or on that which we don't have, maybe on our lack of funds or our lack of stuff. Help us be focused on you. Give us you. May you touch each one of us this morning in Jesus' name.